Welcome to the church family that is lifting lives through living love, inspiring hope, filling with faith, and transforming our world. These recorded messages are made available so that you might have additional opportunities to stay connected with us, and then you might learn and grow in your faith. God bless you as you hear the word today. And now, the message. Our scripture reading this morning is from Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his namesake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. May the Lord add his blessing to the hearing and reading of his word. I am a big believer in the power of books, especially children's books. I mean, they, I'm sure all of us have a particular book, maybe a couple that kind of stand out in our memory, books that were well-loved and read often that we would go back to again and again and again and never get tired of them. One of those books that stands out in my memory was a book that we didn't actually own as a family. It was actually at the church in the church library, but because my mom sang in the choir and volunteered with the youth group, we spent a lot of evenings at the church, and so I would always find my way to the library and find that one particular book and pull it off the shelves and reread the familiar words and run my fingers over, you know, the, the lovingly over the images and illustrations. The story that I particularly loved was an adaptation of the parable of the lost sheep, told from the perspective of the sheep that got lost. But it wasn't just a sheep, it was a little lamb. The image you know, on the screen, it wasn't, this isn't quite the book that I grew up with, but it's close enough that I could use it to kind of illustrate. The, this little lamb uh, got lost, and it didn't intend to get lost. I think it was chasing a butterfly or something like that, but it, it wandered off from the flock, and before it knew it, when it looked up, it was nowhere near the comforting presence of its mom and dad and all the other animals. And so this little lamb began to panic and hasten, trying to find its way back to the flock. And in the process, its leg fell down in a crack, in a crevice, and it was trapped, hurt. And and, and as it was crying out for help, the storm began to move in, and the lamb was alone and afraid. And then just in the nick of the time, uh, the shepherd arrives and pulls the lamb to safety and rescues it from its position, and, and, and all is well. You can see how that story would have had a real powerful impact on a, on a young little boy who'd lost his own dad and was pretty unsure of himself. It, it, it made a lasting impression on me. It became my image of who God was. And even though I'm no longer that little boy, I still find the image of Shepherd to be incredibly comforting, especially in a time and a season like this where many of us are alone and afraid It brings us great comfort to hear these words, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. But what does it mean to say that God is our shepherd? What's implied with those simple words, the Lord is my shepherd? I I think the psalmist implies at least three different meanings that we're gonna explore today as a way of understanding more deeply what it means for God to be our shepherd. The first meaning is kind of right out of the gate. I think the the psalmist wants us to understand that the Lord is our shepherd. That means the Lord is our provider, that that, that God provides everything we need. You look at verses two through, you know, the second and third verse, and, and and the psalmist lays out all the ways in which the shepherd cares for the sheep. He, he makes them lie down in green pastures, food. He leads them beside still waters, drink. He restores their souls. He, 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 he guides their feet in right paths. 
He gives them guidance and protection and shelter. Everything that a, that a lamb could need, food, water, shelter, it's all provided by the shepherd. And it, in the New Testament, when, when the writers of the New Testament talk about Jesus, they often paint him in this picture of, of the good shepherd. And often when they do, it's connected to this sense of, of being a provider. I, I'm sure you're familiar with the story of the feeding of the 5,000, but, but I want you to listen to it again this morning and hear it in, in, as an echo of Psalm 23. The way the story goes, at least the way Mark tells it in his gospel, is that Jesus has been with the people all day long. He's been teaching them and healing them, and it's getting late in the day, and he's tired, and so he says to the disciples, let's get in the boat and cross over to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Come away with me and rest, he says. But there's no rest for the weary because the people see where Jesus is going and, 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 and word spreads from town to town until by the time they get to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, a crowd has gathered waiting for Jesus to show up. And Jesus doesn't say, hey, turn the boat around, let's try this again. Instead, he, he, he looks over the crowd and, and, and the Bible says he looks on them with compassion for he sees what? That they are sheep without a shepherd. And so Jesus steps into that role of shepherd and begins to teach them and heal them and do, and, and do his ministry. But as it starts to get late, the disciples begin to fear that, that the people are going to be hungry. And there's a, a massive horde of them, over 5,000. And so they approach Jesus and they say, teacher, it's late. Send all these people away so they have time to go into the nearby villages and towns and they can find food for themselves. But the shepherd doesn't send the sheep away to get food. The shepherd provides for the people. And so Jesus says, well, give them something to eat then. The disciples despair. They say, do you see how many people are here? That would take half a year's wages to provide food for them. We don't have that. Jesus says, well, what do you have? He says, well, the disciples said, we have five loaves of bread and two fish. And Jesus says, give it to me. And then notice this detail. He instructs all the people to sit down in groups on the green grass. A deliberate allusion to Psalm 23. And then Jesus takes this amount, which doesn't seem to be enough. He blesses it, multiplies it, distributes it, and it turns out to be 12 baskets more than what was needed to feed all the people. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He tells me to sit down on the green grass, to sit down in the place where I don't think I have enough. I, I heard or a, a, a read an author years ago reflecting on this part of the psalm, and she asked the question that I never thought to ask before. Why does the shepherd have to make the sheep lie down? I mean, wouldn't sheep of their own desire and accord, wouldn't they naturally lie down where the grass is green? And so she reflects and says, well, maybe it's because the sheep don't recognize where the green grass is. They have to be forced to lie down in other places. And then she commented, she says, in my own life, there's been plenty of times where God has made me lie down in a place that I didn't think was green at all. All the grass looked brown and lifeless to me. And yet in retrospect, looking back, even in that place, there was green grass. There was something I needed to grow as his disciple. I, I, we're in this coronavirus season, right? And, and one of the things that our family does a couple times every day is we just walk around the neighborhood just to get some fresh air and keep from going stir crazy. And, and always when I walk around the neighborhood, there's, there's a handful of homes that have that perfect green lawn. You know, the one that it just looks so, it, 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 you know, everyone envies. And whenever I get back to my home, I see nothing but brown. You know, like I, I, what, I, I long for the greener grass. And, and I, I recognize that sometimes we as sheep, we always think the grass is greener on the other side and we're always chasing, chasing, chasing after that green grass. And we don't recognize that right where we are, perhaps is exactly where God wants us to be. Uh, we've been watching The Office multiple times on Netflix, but the, at the end of the uh, his whole series, there's a character, Andy Bernard, who has spent all of his time on the show chasing, 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 never satisfied with where he is. And then finally on the last episode, he says, 
I wish there was a way to know you were in the good old days before you actually left them. I don't know that these are going to be the good old days, but I do wonder if in this place where all the the grass seems brown, perhaps God isn't providing something for us even here and now, providing something for you at home that he is able to nourish your soul right now in a way that he never could if you were always on the go as our lives used to be. I recognize this is an audacious claim, the claim that God is our provider in a time where we are so aware of our scarcity. I mean, just look at our world. Uh, all medical providers and first responders, they don't have the, the masks and the testing kits they need. Uh, food banks are overwhelmed with need. Grocery stores have empty shelves. There are families, many in our church, who are struggling with unemployment. And, and, and that's just in our country. That, that's, that's not even taking into account the needs of all the world. And it, it'd be easy for any of us to despair, just like the disciples despaired that day and say, oh Lord, the need is too much will never have enough. And yet I see people in our own church, in our own community, filling in those gaps. People who are making masks, sewing them, you know, as quickly as they can to provide people with protection. I, people who are, who are working in food banks and making donations and helping people pay no, you know, utility bills and families and neighbors caring for one another and going to the grocery store. I, I guess... I'm just becoming more and more aware that that where there is an abundance of love, there's always more than enough. That that love fills in all the gaps that we worry about. Maybe we can learn the lessons from the disciples and learn that when God is present and we offer what we have, God multiplies to meet the needs, not just of our own souls, but of the world around us. The Lord is my shepherd, the psalmist declares. And then what comes next? I shall not want. In the midst of our culture that is so focused on want, 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 more, 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 this psalm goes against that grain and says, no, if we just trust in the provision of our shepherd, that trust displaces our want. And as want is moved out of our lives, as we trust more and more and more, then we learn to rest, to lie down in green pastures, to linger beside still waters, and that rest restores our soul. It's amazing what happens in our spirits when we learn to trust that God is our shepherd and our provider. But that's only the first part, the first couple verses of the psalm. Midway through the psalm, we get introduced to a new dimension of God's care. It, it, it takes place in that part where it says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of evil. And when we're in that place, walking through the valley of the shadow of death, it's not just enough for God to be our provider. In that space, we also need God to be our protector. And so the psalmist declares, I will, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Again, I want to just pause there because when I hear the word comfort, the words that come to my mind are not rod and staff. I think about, you know, stuffed animals and nightlights and cuddly blankets that, you know, kind of wrap around us. That's an image of comfort for me. Rods and staffs, they're, they're hard. They're instruments of, of maybe correction. And, you know, for the, whenever the sheep are going astray, they get pulled back by the rod and the staff. But in this place... In the valley of the shadow where there's, where there's enemies all around, the rod and the staff are the shepherd's protection. They're instruments that the shepherd will use to ward off anyone who means us harm. And then this metaphor of protection is carried forward in the next verse. You prepare a table before me. Where? In the presence of my enemies. So even when I am surrounded by those who wish to do me harm, you 
Ask me to sit and trust in your protection. And in that place, you anoint my head with oil. You claim me as your own. My cup overflows. Even with my enemies around me, they can't touch me because they can't take away your blessing and your protection. This image of God as protector is carried over again into the New Testament. We talked about the feeding of the 5,000 and how Jesus was the, the provider for all those people. Now we come into the image of Jesus as protector. We go to John chapter 10. And in that place, Jesus makes the claim, I am the good shepherd. And he goes on to explain in contrast with the hired hand. He says, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep, but the hired hand is not the shepherd and he doesn't own the sheep. So when the, he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. Jesus is saying, in contrast to the hired hand who abandons the sheep in a moment of trouble, I am the good shepherd who will stand with them and who will lay down my life for them. In some ways, it's an odd image of protection. I mean, let's again thinking about our current cultural context. When I say the word protection, for a lot of us, what comes to our minds are all the things we're using to protect ourselves from the coronavirus, the, the face masks that we wear in the stores, the distance that we put between ourselves and others. And, and there is a big climate of fear because even with all those protections in place, the coronavirus has touched our lives and it's not something we can see, taste, touch. It, it, it's scary that even with all those things in place, we still if not be, you know, fall direct victims and being sick, it will touch our lives, it will touch people we know, it is impacting our country. And so we cry out to God, protect us from this evil. But here's the thing about the 23rd Psalm, it does not promise that we won't face evil, that no bad thing will happen to us. It just promises that when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, God will be with us. And that's why I come back to Jesus as the good shepherd. He lays down his life for the sheep. Jesus didn't protect his own life, but the wolf came and snatched him away. It nailed him to a cross, and he died. But the good news that we celebrate on Easter is that Jesus did not stay dead. On the third day, he rose from the grave and he defeated forever the power of death itself. And so when we say, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we have confidence that Jesus is with us. Why? Because he walked that same journey himself for our sake. Doesn't mean that no evil will befall us. It just means that no evil will destroy us because the shepherd has laid down his life for us to safeguard our souls and nothing that ever happens to us in this life will ever be able to separate us from God's love. For the shepherd has claimed us. We belong to him, we're part of his flock. Jesus says, I know my sheep and my sheep know me. They, they recognize my voice. He, 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 he says there's a relationship between the shepherd and the sheep. We're not strangers. We know one another. And again, you go back to the 23rd Psalm, and you see a shift that happens here in the fourth verse. Up until now, the psalmist refers to the Lord in the third person. He makes me walk, uh, lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. It's, it's he, 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 he. But in the fourth verse, suddenly that he becomes you. Not he is with me, but you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You anoint my head with oil so my cup overflows. There's a shift that happens in all of our faiths when we don't just talk about God, but when God becomes personal, when he becomes you. 
And often it is when we go through a difficult time, when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, that's the moment when God becomes real, when we cry out, when it's not enough just to cry out to a he who's on high as protector, but a, but a you who is with us, who walks with us through the valley. And I don't know if, how you would describe your own relationship with Jesus. If Jesus is a far off he, you know, that, that is abstract, or if you would understand Jesus as a you, someone with whom you can talk, someone who walks with you every step of the way. And if you feel like, oh, I'm more the first one, more of Jesus as a he, just know that even now, it doesn't take much, just, just a prayer for Jesus to become you, for us to be brought into a relationship to know that God is with us, whatever evil we may be facing, for us to know that he is our provider and our protector. And then we get to the third dimension of shepherd. And this isn't spelled out explicitly in the 23rd Psalm, but it's implied all the way throughout that to proclaim the Lord as our shepherd is to acknowledge God as our personal king. See, this is the most common metaphor for kingship in the Old Testament, the word shepherd. It's used again and again and again to describe kings. The the writer of the psalm, King David, was himself a shepherd. And so he knew the role that shepherds had to provide, protect, to guide the, the sheep. And he knew that was his role as the king, to provide, protect, to guide the people of Israel. And so that metaphor of kingship and shepherd, they get intertwined. You can see this uh, very explicitly in Ezekiel chapter 34. Uh, Ezekiel is prophesying to the people after a time of great destruction, and he's bemoaning the false leaders, the, the bad shepherds that they've had. He says, woe to you, shepherds of Israel who only take care of yourselves. Should not shepherds take care of the flock too? You eat the curds, you clothe yourselves with wool, and you slaughter the choice animals. In other words, you take all the benefits, but you do not take care of the flock. You have not strengthened the weak or healed the sick or bound up the injured. You have not brought back the strays or searched for the lost. You have ruled them harshly and brutally. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd. And when they were scattered, they became food for all the wild animals. My sheep wandered all over all the mountains on every high hill. They were scattered over the whole earth and no one searched for them or looked for them. It's a sad state when people live without shepherds. But when God sees the, the, the plight of his people Israel, he makes this beautiful promise. And jumping ahead, he promises to be their shepherd. So jumping ahead, he says, I myself will search for my sheep and look after them. As a shepherd looks after his scattered flock when he is with them, so will I look after my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places where they are scattered on a day of clouds and darkness. I will bring them out from the nations, gather them from the countries. I will bring them into their own land and I will pasture them on the mountains of Israel, in the ravines and in all the settlements of the land. I myself will tend my sheep and have them lie down, declares the sovereign Lord, the King. I will search for the lost and bring back the strays. I will bind up the injured and strengthen the weak, but the sleek and the strong I will destroy. I will shepherd the flock with justice." You see, he doesn't just shepherd the flock with compassion and mercy, although he abounds in compassion and mercy, especially for those who are weak or lost or ill or hurt. But he also shepherds the flock with with justice, with truth and order. He, He rules over all things to bring all things into alignment. So to declare that God is our shepherd is to acknowledge his authority, to make him the the king of our hearts, the king of our lives, the the king of our church. And, And then it's to bring our life and our church, every part of us into alignment with his rule and his will. That's why we pray every time we say the Lord's Prayer, thy kingdom come, thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven, in my life, just as you would have it done. So we give God authority over who we are and all we have. And the trade-off for that is that as we give God authority, we enter into trust. And And our shepherd provides for our every need. He makes us lie down. He leads us beside still waters. He restores our souls. He protects us from every enemy. He, he prepares tables before us and, and anoints our heads with oil so that our, our cup overflows. And then comes my, my favorite part. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. The word goodness, so the words goodness and mercy, they're just not good sounding words, they, they, they have meaning, they describe characteristics of God. The word goodness, we talked about this you know, last fall when we did our series about every good thing, the, 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 the word good, the Hebrew word is tov, and it is an essential characteristic of who God is, that you can't separate God and goodness, you can't have goodness apart from God, it's, they're one and the same in Hebrew thought. And then that word mercy, surely goodness and mercy, the word mercy there is hesed. It's the highest form of love. It, it's, it's frequently translated throughout the Psalms as, as God's loving kindness, his covenant loyalty, his faithfulness to the end. And so goodness and mercy, loving kindness, will follow me all the days of my life. The word follow there in Hebrew is radaf. It, it, follow is kind of a weak translation. What it literally means is, is pursue, like, like, like a, an army pursuing its enemies. In fact, throughout the rest of the Psalms, whenever David or you know, the Psalms use that word radaf, it usually is in reference to enemies pursuing him. Oh God, help me, he cries out, for my enemies are pursuing me, radaf. Except in this place, it's not enemies pursuing him, but it's God's goodness and mercy shall pursue me, shall chase me, shall run me down. And when that happens at the end of my days, when I am overtaken by God's goodness and mercy, then I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. There's a pattern to the psalm. There's three different I shall statements, and I think each corresponds to a dimension of God that I've been trying to lay out. When we understand that the Lord is our provider, then we shall not want. And when we trust God as our protector, then we shall not fear. And when we recognize the Lord as our king, then comes the promise that we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Jesus said, in my Father's house, there are many, many rooms. If it were not so, would I tell you now that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back again so that where I am, there you may also be. We shall dwell together in the house of the Lord forever. And I think that's my favorite part of the promise, is that we shall dwell together in the house of the Lord. The rest of the psalm is all very individual. Lots of I's and me's and my's, you know? And even in this statement, it's I shall dwell. But it's not that I'm gonna dwell in the house of the Lord alone. No, the house of the Lord is a communal image because the house of the Lord is filled with all those who acknowledge God as king, who have reason to sing his praises eternally. And so to me, this is the metaphor that right now, We are all like scattered sheep. And each of us is walking our own individual path with our shepherd, learning to trust in his provision and in his protection. But the good news is there will come a day. There will come a day when we will not be scattered, but instead we will be gathered together 
And when we are gathered together, free at last from the tyranny of fear and want, when we are gathered together in that time, we will sing a song, born out of the trials and the difficulties which we face, a song of praise and thanksgiving for God's goodness and mercy, which are pursuing us even now. And of that joy, that goodness and that love, there will be no end. So in just a moment, our choir is going to sing a song. And this is a song of reflection. It's intended as a space for you to reflect on what does this message mean for me today? I encourage you, perhaps, to name your fears and to name your wants, to name the struggles that you're facing, the places where you feel like, I don't have enough. And then next to those fears and wants, simply say the word shepherd and recognize God's provision. Recognize God's protection. Recognize God's sovereignty and God's closeness with us, with you. And remember that even now, right where you are, God's goodness and mercy is pursuing you. And someday we will all dwell together in the house of the Lord.